I wrote in the um, bulletin article this week about you know, back when I drove school bus, taking a busload of fourth graders up to Norland Farms. I don't think they're in operation any longer, but it was such a neat place. When you walked through the gates, you walked into 1870 America. It was a living museum. And this big old guy with a white beard, he could have played Santa Claus without any padding or anything, was the curator there. And the first thing they did, as I said in the article, they, they split up the boys and the girls. The girls wore aprons and little bonnets, and they were helping to prepare the noon meal. The boys did chores. Well, everyone was given a name tag of a family member who had lived there for the past, sometime during the past 125 years. And so the, the curator with the boys, he said, you know, you boys are going to be doing all kinds of chores like yoking the oxen and this and that and shuffling manure. Any questions? And one little hand went up. And he goes, yes. And he goes, uh, what's manure? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they found out what manure was. But that was such a good visit uh, there. And as I say in the article, what really struck me in 1870 rural America was the respect that the father received in the home from the family members. That was very notable. So in 19th century America, there could be no mistake that the father was the head of the family. And he was loved. He was respected by his wife and children as seen in the, the manners and courtesy that were shown to him. And his wisdom was appreciated. And his authority was readily acknowledged by the family. And through the years, into the 20th century, through World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and throughout the 1950s, and even into the early, maybe to the mid-60s, this model of fatherhood and the nuclear family remain virtually unchanged in our country. And the definition of the nuclear family is a father and mother and their dependent children regarded as a basic social, social unit. So that's what is known as the nuclear family. It's a traditional type of family, isn't it? It's what we've known for years. And it's a family structure that is the core building block of any society. From 1954 to 1960, there was a television show that was entitled Father Knows Best. Some of you have seen that show. Uh, it starred Robert Young. He played the character of Jim Anderson. And Jim Anderson was an insurance man, and that was his job. But he dealt with everyday problems of his growing family. Um, and although he often made mistakes, because he was portrayed as a real dad, he often made mistakes, and he did apologize for these mistakes. Jim Anderson was the head of his family, and he was loved and respected by his family. <clears throat> his wife, Margaret, who was played by Jane Wyatt, she was a stay-at-home mom. Um, and the family gave thanks before meals. And this is on TV, being projected into homes all over America. In the fall of 1957, we saw for the first time the show Leave It to Beaver. Yep, Leave It to Beaver. Um, Theodore Cleaver, with the nickname of Beaver. Uh, Ward Cleaver was played by Hugh Beaumont. And Ward was a good dad. And he also made some mistakes. But he usually excelled in imparting his keen wisdom and his common sense and his philosophy of life to his sons, Wally and Beaver. And it was clear that Ward was the head of the home, and he was respected as such. His wife, June, was also a stay-at-home mom, as was my mother, as was Betty's mother, and many mothers back in the 50s and 60s. In 1958, The Rifleman aired. We're still watching that one, The Rifleman. Uh, Chuck Connors played a single parent. 
uh, Lucas McCain, and he was raising his son, Mark, who was played by Johnny Crawford, who had been on the Mouseketeers before. Um, and they're in the uh, western New Mexico frontier. That's where they lived. And Lucas was clearly the provider and protector of, of his family. And the episodes of the Rifleman drew a, a clear distinction between good and evil. And often they contain good, solid, moral teaching. And that's the way a lot of these shows were back in the 50s and 60s. Then in 1960, The Andy Griffith Show. Uh, it was uh, a spinoff of Danny Thomas. Have you seen that episode? It is hilarious. Where they first introduced uh, Andy Griffith as Sheriff Andy Taylor. Uh, it, is, it is really funny. Um, but he was a single parent, uh, Sheriff Andy Taylor, with his son, Opie, and Aunt B, who did all the cooking and cleaning in the house. The first two seasons of this show usually contained a very strong moral message in each episode. Andy was caring, he was wise, he was nurturing to his son, Opie. And Opie always said his prayers before going to bed. Again, that was shown on American TV, projected into all the homes throughout the country. Then in the mid to late 60s and into the early 70s, something happened. America experienced a radical anti-establishment sexual revolution where all traditional norms were rejected and almost any standard of authority was rebelled against. And a lot of us here lived through that. We saw it. And we as a society have never really recovered from this. As authority figures, fathers took a beating. They took a beating during this time, and the institution of fatherhood was severely derided, ridiculed, and greatly diminished. And we've never recovered from this either in our society. So after John Walton, who was the father on the Waltons, and Charles Ingalls, who was the father on Little House on the Prairie, um, in, the, in the 70s, TV fathers have been increasingly degraded and dishonored. But don't take my word for it. Here are excerpts from two articles, and these articles are from secular magazines. That's why I chose them, because that's important. These are secular magazines who are making these observations, and they bear witness to the fact that fathers have been taken a real beating over the years. <clears throat> the first is from Atlantic Magazine. Imagine that, Atlantic Magazine. Not your most conservative pub. And it's entitled, Dads on Sitcoms. On television shows, dads have been portrayed as incompetent dolts reflecting and encouraging a damaging attitude towards men and child care. Wow. It's a great opening sentence, isn't it? Gets our attention. As a new dad, I've often been struck with horror at dads I see on TV. On the small screen, dads are adults. Dads are idiots. And while it may seem harmless to get a few cheap laughs at dad's expense, these characters and their hilarious incompetence form the cultural backdrop for our society's larger discussion about the roles fathers play in families. On TV, if there's a dad in the home, he is portrayed as an idiot. It must have reflected uh, our own discomfort with dads being competent, said Hannah Rosen on a panel about the future of fatherhood at Aspen Ideas Conference. You put a dad in front of his kid, and the dad gives the worst advice. You put a dad in front of a toaster, he burns the house down. The idiot dad stereotype structures both expectations, both the expectations mother have of fathers and of their children, and how men see their own role within the family. <clears throat> because men may not always know what to do when the baby starts crying or needs to take a nap, or needs <clears throat> a bottle to be warmed, or the toddler needs to go to the bathroom, they end up as the bumbling sitcom dad, or at best, 
the junior varsity parents, as some refer to the dads who visit the local park on weekends. But not all dads are total fools. Some enjoy being fathers and take their responsibilities seriously. We need to see more of these dads on TV. To which we would all add a hearty and heartfelt amen, right? <clears throat> So that was from The Atlantic. Here's one from Desert News, and it's called Dumbing Down Dad. How media, how media present husbands, fathers as useless. If you watch TV, then you've most likely witnessed the portrayal of the modern day husband and father as lazy, incompetent, and stupid. Just these three characteristics are sure to bring to one uh, to mind, one commercial or sitcom that personifies this type of man. One evening after watching Homer Simpson wreck the family car at a mo monster truck rally and then plunge on a skateboard into Springfield Gorge, my six-year-old son asked me, Dad, why are dads on TV so dumb? So he noticed this as a six-year-old. Where did we fathers go wrong? We spend twice as much time with our kids as we did two decades ago, but on television, we're oblivious, troubled, deranged, and generally incompetent. Even if Dad has a good job, like the star of Home Improvement, uh, he's forever making messes that must be straightened out by Mom. The doofus Dad stereotype isn't new. There's Fred Flintstone, Dagwood, Bumstead, and even Charlie Brown's monotone parents. But the consistency of these new portrayals has slowly created a new norm, opposed to what being a father used to mean. While dads in Leave it to Beaver and the Donna Reed show had flaws, they were close to what was then thought as the perfect part of the idea <coughs> idealized American family. This was noted by Bob Thompson, director of the Blair Center for Television and Popular Cultures at Syracuse University. Later shows such as The Cosby Show, Family Ties, Growing Pains, and Full House showcase caring dads of a new generation. Of course, later allegations of sexual assault against Cosby, however, forever, forever changed the way that particular show's namesake is viewed. <clears throat> But by the late 1980s, more shows wanted to distance themselves from the corny, syrupy stuff. And in step shows such as Married with Children and The Simpsons. And that's just to mention a few examples within the sitcom sphere. Commercials have also created their own standard for men. Ad after ad makes Doltich Dad the butt of all jokes, wrote Seth Stevenson of Slate Magazine. He's outwitted by his children. He's the target of condescending eye rolls from his wife. He's a dumb, incompetent, sometimes even selfish oaf, but his mature understanding family loves him anyway. There are some real concerns about the consequences of such media content. Negative general portrayals of fathers, husbands, and men in TV commercials and sitcoms contributes to a decrease in men wanting to assume the, those roles in society and creates the impression, among others, that men need not assume such roles anyway, and such simply aren't important. These negative stereotypes minimize the father's role in the home and send a flawed message that good fathers either don't matter or are not needed. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I thought that was very well, very well done. Again, that's a desert news. So. <clears throat> The institution of fatherhood is in big trouble. It's in big trouble in our country, among other things. Here's a, a Census Bureau report, this article. A recent U.S. Census Bureau report states there is a father absence crisis in America. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 19.7 million children uh, more than one in four live without a father in the home. This data represents children living without a biological step or adoptive father. So there's a real vacuum there. Consequently, there is a father factor in nearly all social ills facing America today. Research shows when a child is raised in a father-absent home, 
he or she is affected in the following ways. <clears throat> Girls are seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen. There is a four times greater risk of poverty. Between the mom and child, there is a two times greater risk of infant mortality. The child is two times more likely to suffer obesity, two times more likely to drop out of high school, more likely to face abuse and neglect, more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, more likely to, to commit crime, and more likely to go to prison. And this is from fatherhood.org, those stats. So, while almost any man can father a child, being a real dad is all important. And the need for fathers who live in the home with their family and provide for the family has never been greater than it is now. And beyond that, being a godly father is even more important and the need is even greater. So let's look at the profile of a godly father. First, a godly father is one who loves God. His heart has been touched by the gospel, that form of doctrine which he has obeyed from the heart, as Romans chapter 6 verse 17 says. He loves God because he has seen how very much God loves him. As the scripture says, we love him because he first loved us, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. Therefore, it is the love of Christ that constrains the godly father, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. It is God love, God's love that motivates him. It is God's love that encourages him in everything that he does. A godly father loves the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, and with all his strength. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And Jesus said, this is the first and greatest commandment. And because a godly father loves God with every inch and with every ounce of his being, he seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And this translates to consistent, faithful obedience to God. And... To God's will as revealed in his word. A godly father is faithful in his worship to God and he's faithful in his Christian service. His light shines brightly, that is his example, his influence for Christ is always shining brightly for everyone to see, especially those closest to him, especially his wife and his children. And this love for God is also manifested in his relationship with others. A godly father observes the second greatest commandment identified by Jesus in Mark chapter 12, verse 31. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He treats others as he would want to be treated, as Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so he treats those around him with kindness. He treats those around him with compassion, with courtesy, and with respect. And he is usually respected in return. Secondly, a godly father provides for his family. And this goes all the way back to the beginning, to the creation. While a woman was created to bear children and nurse them and nurture them, a man was created to be the provider and the protector of his family. He has a bigger bone structure. He has larger muscle mass designed by his creator for this purpose. Not in vogue today. Not popular to say that today, is it? But this was the purpose of the creator. That's why men and women are different. And this has nothing to do with status. It has nothing to do with importance. It has nothing to do with value or personal Worth. It has to do with God-given roles, God-assigned roles. The value of man's soul and woman's soul is equal in the eyes of God. But their roles, their, their functions were designed by God 
to be different. When the inspired apostle Peter refers to a man's wife as the weaker vessel, well, that gets some people riled up. But he refers to the wife, the woman, as the weaker vessel. He's not diminishing her worth when he says that, nor is he citing some kind of defect in the woman. He's merely drawing a distinction between masculinity and femininity. There's a difference. There's a difference between men and women. There's a difference between how they're, how they're built, how they're put together. And it was God who created this distinction. Now society, and we can even put Satan in there, he attempts to blur the lines. There's unisex, there's gender neutrality, there's all, oh, we could just go into a myriad of things, which we won't. And just as God has placed within women the natural ability to mother children, God has placed within man the innate drive and desire to be the provider and protector of his family. And many in our enlightened society, they seek to reject this fact and they attempt to reprogram modern man. But the drive is there nonetheless. It's there. It's God-given. The wise old Jewish sage Sirach offers some wisdom concerning this. He says, when a man is supported by his wife, there is sure to be anger, arrogance, and humiliation. And this is true because it runs counter, it runs contrary to the way God made us. God is serious about man providing for his family. As the scripture says in 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So God is serious about man providing for his home. But a godly father provides for his family in other ways as well, not only materially, but for their emotional well-being. Um, big phrase years ago was, he's emotionally absent. Uh, father needs to be emotionally there. He needs to be emotionally present. Uh, the inspired apostle Paul makes a beautiful statement regarding fatherhood in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, as a father deals with his own children. That's, that's a simile. That's a stated comparison. Encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. That's what a godly father does. Brothers and sisters, our families need godly fathers who will live out the truth of this verse. Amen? Amen. Third, a godly father provides spiritual teaching and guidance. As the head of the family, he is the spiritual model and example in the home. And this goes all the way back to the beginning as well. God commanded the Hebrew fathers to teach and to train their children to provide them with spiritual guidance and direction. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Go to chapter 6. Chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's begin reading in verse 1. <clears throat> now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently 
to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So he says in verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then in verse 6, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. So that word heart, of course, means the mind. It is the inner man. It is the understanding. It is the thought life, the seat of human emotion and passion. God's teaching is to be internalized and made an integral part of our lives. We are to learn it and live it. That's what he's talking about. And then he says in verse 7, you shall teach your children diligently. So this word, uh, teach their phrase, I should say, teach them diligently, is to inculcate, to cause something to be learned by repeating it again and again. To teach and impress by frequent repetitions. Because repetition is a tool of learning, isn't it? It's a tool of learning. God is at the center of your life, and your focus is to be on His will for your life. And that's the way Israel was. God was at the center of their lives, and He was the, the main focus of all that they did. We know that the Hebrew fathers faithfully obeyed this command throughout the centuries. God was at the center of their family lives, and his word was diligently taught to each succeeding generation. Now, if you would turn to um, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, go down to verse 23. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. The king had commanded that all Hebrew uh, baby boys be thrown into the Nile and killed. <clears throat> by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because she had been, he, Moses had been found in the little ark in the basket and Pharaoh's daughter uh, raised him as her own. So that's what that's talking about. So he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So the question that this raises is where did Moses get such faith? He was raised by Pharaoh's daughter, who was an Egyptian. They were idolaters. They were polytheists. They had many, many gods. Where did Moses get this, this type of faith? He got it from his parents, Amram and Jochebed, who taught him the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10. Verse 17. And this principle carried over to the new covenant. Fathers are still charged with this responsibility of teaching and training their children in the will and the ways of God. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, a verse that's well known to all of us, I'm sure. Ephesians chapter 6. This is a text that Jim read for us this morning, but we'll zero in on verse 4, which is directed at specifically to fathers. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So this word training is to nurture, to educate, to instruct. And this instruction includes disciplinary correction, which also is not in vogue today. And it relates to the cultivation of the mind and the cultivation of morals, ethical morals. And when it says uh, admonition, 
This is a mild rebuke. An admonition is a mild rebuke. It's a warning that's, that's meant to correct mistakes, to curb passions. That's the idea. So this is what the fathers were uh, tasked with by our Creator, by our Heavenly Father, God. And now uh, Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, down to verse 21, again directed specifically to fathers. And here the, the Word of God says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And when they become discouraged, they may say, throw up their hands and say, why bother? So that's not the spirit that, that needs to be cultivated in children. So fathers are not to deliberately or intentionally discourage their children. Rather, they are to encourage them. And that E-N means to, to put in or place into. So fathers are to place courage into their children. That's the idea. And as 1 Thessalonians 2.11 says, which we already looked at before, um, you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging. And that means inspiring, building them up, strengthening them, comforting. That means reassuring, again, lifting them up and urging them to live lives worthy of God. That's what a father is to do. This is the caliber of men, the fathers we need in the Lord's church and in our nation. Amen? Amen. So on Father's Day and every day, let's be sure to honor godly fathers. Let's be sure to honor the godly fathers among us and show them respect and give them our appreciation. And this day and age, they are a rare breed. And they're dwindling. Again, they're not perfect, but these godly men are doing the best they can to follow after God and to obey His will and to teach their children to do the same. So let's pray for these men. Let's work to encourage and assist them in any way that we can because it's a difficult job, isn't it? It's not easy in the society in which we live. <clears throat> in a godless society, godly fathers shine as lights in the world. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. And they need all the help, all the support, and all the encouragement that you and I can give them. If God's word, which is alive and powerful, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, if God's word has touched your heart this morning, if you need to repent of ongoing sin in your life, God gives you, our gracious God gives you the opportunity to do this right now, to repent of your sins. If you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, God gives you the opportunity to do that now. Whatever you need, God invites you to come for the help that you need. So please come now and make your request known as we stand and sing.